Today we are going to study about surface tension and elasticity of lungs and chest wall. These concepts are essential in order to understand the lung mechanics which we will be discussing in episode 3. Let's begin. So elasticity is opposite of compliance, where compliance is the stretchability, elasticity is the tendency of a substance, let's say lung, to recoil back to its original position once it is deformed. So it is change in pressure divided by change in volume. Take an example of a red rubber band, right? And let's see the similarity between the band and the lungs. Now when you stretch on this rubber band, it would try to recoil back or snap back to its original position if of course this rubber band is more elastic or it has more elastance then the change in its shape would generate more pressure and it would require higher pressures to cause further stretchability of the band in a similar way when the lungs are expanded the elastin fiber within the lungs tries to recoil the lung back to its original form. So elastance of any substance is its ability to return back to its original position. In other words, it is the stubborn nature of any substance to return back to its original initial position once you have deshaped it. For example, if we say that the lung is fibrosed, so it would generate more pressures in the lungs to a very small minute change in its volume and the lung would tend to recoil back and that is the restrictive pattern of the lung. So the lung compliance is reduced and elastance is increased, right? So compliance and elastance are opposite to each other. We will be covering compliance later. So we have learned that elastance is directly proportional to a change in pressure and it is inversely proportional to a change in volume. There are two factors that cause the elastic recoil of lungs. Number one, surface tension and number two, the elastin fiber. The elastin fiber essentially behaves as the red rubber band, right? And of course, the latest research says that the septa around the alveoli, which give it the structural integrity, they are also the contributing factor to the elastic recoil or the tendency of lung to snap back to its original form. We come across this terminology surface tension of the lungs, surface tension of the alveoli causing the collapse. But we have never gone into the chemistry or the physical forces behind surface tension. So what happens is that in a water body, let's say the red colored um, oxygen and it is bound to hydrogen atoms making a H2O molecule. Now in a water body there are millions of H2O molecules and each molecule exerts a pulling pressure or a pull on the molecule around it, be it upwards, sidewards or downwards. But what happens when this water body interacts with the air? Now the molecules on the surface of the water will have a more pull from the molecules inside the water body, but there won't be any opposing force from the opposite side. As a result of which, the molecules would be driven inside the water body leaving a gap on the surface which will automatically be filled up by the other surface molecules pulling onto each other. So the net force exerted by this water body is its tendency to move inwards and downwards. This is called the surface tension on water airs interface, right? So how does the alveolus uh, prevent the surface tension from collapsing it? By producing surfactant. Now surfactant is a phospholipid which is produced by type 2 pneumocytes. We have discussed that in episode 1, right? And if we were to see the structure of the surfactant, it's got a hydrophilic or a water loving head which is blue in color, let's say, and a hydrophobic tail. What this surfactant does 
is that it fills in those gaps that are left behind by the intermolecular forces pulling on the water molecules on the surface. It cancels out the intermolecular pulls from the surface water molecules, right? Now the hydrophilic part of the surfactant is of course pulled downwards by the other water molecules. However, in terms of surfactant, it's got an opposing force in the form of hydrophobic tail as a result of which the surfactant remains on the surface of the water air interface and prevents any inward or downward force from collapsing the alveolus see graphically how this water lining behaves in the alveolus. Now the surface tension tends to drive the water molecules inside and inwards right as a result of which alveolar collapse might occur. But type 2 pneumocytes produce surfactant and this surfactant cancels out the surface tension exerted by the water lining or the water air interface. Now, as per Laplace's law for any spherical body this is the equation of surface tension. Can you see that the surface tension is directly proportional to the radius, right? Greater the radius, greater the surface tension exerted and vice versa. We will see how the alveoli behave through this equation. So, in end expiratory phase when the alveoli are small and collapsed, there is no air in the alveolus. So, the surface tension would be high because it is only water-water interface, no water-air interface, right? Now, if the surface tension is high, it means the elastance is high and that is why the collapsed alveolus is falling in the lower red zone of the compliance curve of the lungs. We will study that later. Don't go for the graph right now. My point is that the compliance would be low at this point and the elastance would be high. So, it would require a greater pressure to re-expand this alveolus. And this is the reason why surface tension is so important in a newborn infant. So, it's all water in the lungs and that first breath of the newborn requires a lot of inflating pressure because the elastance is high due to increased surface tension. So, when the lungs are not mature, let's say for a premature infant in infant respiratory distress syndrome the surfactant is reduced as a result of which a very high inflating pressure is required in such premature infants and this is the reason why the alveoli stay shut in other words atelectasis this is where the role of surfactant comes into play in cancelling out all these surface tension forces that are preventing the lung from expanding so, in a collapsed alveolus, we saw that the water-water interface was causing more surface tension. But the surfactant would also be in a more concentrated form in a small alveolus, as a result of which it would cancel out those surface tension forces. And when the alveolus is fully expanded, this surfactant tends to be dispersed, right? Because the volume of alveolus is high. So, when the surfactant is dispersed, it would result in more surface tension forces to collapse the alveolus. This would prevent the over distension of the alveolus and barotrauma. This is a story of surface tension of a single alveolus, right? Now imagine there are 300 to 500 million alveoli in a single lung. And the second factor is of course the elastin fiber. We have already discussed an example of a rubber band. So in a similar way when the elastin is overstretched it would try to recoil back to its original position. So these two are the key forces behind elastic recoil or the elastance of the lungs. In terms of chest wall, the chest wall is not only bones, it's got the cartilage as well, right? And a fair amount of cartilage, as a result of which there is elastic recoil of the chest as well, only in opposite direction, right? The lungs recoil inwards, the chest wall tends to recoil outwards and this is where nature has it in the form of intrapleural pressures which maintain a very fine balance between these opposing recoils between chest wall and the lungs. This is all about the elastance of the lungs. Now we are going to hit the lung mechanics in the next episode. Stay tuned.